this agenda today. So I want to make sure, hope, hope that we can get through everything. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And as part of that, I'm going to stop my video so you don't see me waving my hands around at you um, and share my screen. Uh, here we go. If folks would mute themselves, that would be, I know that's yes, Deb's please, preference. Yep, please do mute yourself. There will be time um, at the end of to. the session. Bottom, yeah. left hand bottom of your screen, there should be like a little icon of a, of a um, microphone. If you're on a desk, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, uh, if you're on an iPad, Leslie might be able to help with that. But usually at the bottom of the left hand of the screen, you should see a little microphone. And if you click on that, you'll see a little line go through it and that should, that should mute it for you. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to minimize that. As I said, um, there will be questions. At, uh, there will be time at the end for questions and answers. If you have any questions, uh, you can also on the bottom of your screen you can type in any questions you have in the chat box, and I'll also take a look at those at the end of the session. But um, thanks for returning, those of you who are returning, or hello to those of you who are here for the first time. These sessions are recorded, so if you miss any of them, you can always go to the Love Living at Home YouTube channel and find them there. So last week's, uh, Leslie told me the, the first week's one is up now, so you can look at that. Before we get started, I did want to um, circle back to a question someone had last week about the size of London, the geographic size of London. And I had said at the beginning of the session that it's 608 square miles. I am horrible at math, so don't hold me to these other figures. But And I'm not sure how totally accurate they are. But my understanding is from north to south, it's about 35, 40 miles, um, same from east to west, about 35, 40 miles. And the circumference around greater London is about 150 miles. So hopefully that answers the question someone had regarding how far, how far things are in terms of from one end to the other. But today, um, so last week we looked at what was in essence the founding of London. And we talked about the Roman occupation and how it formed the city of London, that one square mile where you can still see some traces of the Romans today. But today we're gonna move on uh, to medieval London. This is a period of significant turmoil, upheaval, change. And given the amount of material we're covering in this course and the fact that our primary focus really is London, we're gonna move pretty quickly through this time period, uh, at least in regard to broad historical events. Now we are gonna, of course, review key dates and events as they pertain to London. And again, those handouts, um, you, can, you can also refer to uh, either while I'm talking or or afterwards. So, oops, you don't wanna go that way. Okay, so what's the agenda today? Well, we're gonna talk very briefly about the first few centuries after the Romans left London. And it was, it was ruled alternately by Saxons and Vikings. This period uh, is commonly referred to as the Dark Ages, although historians are kind of moving away from that term these days. And then we're gonna move pretty quickly on to the Norman conquest of 1066, this is what really launched the medieval period. And from there, we will um, go right on up until the, the Tudor period, uh, the beginning of the Tudor period. There's so much to cover in the medieval period. I am going to split it into two weeks. I, I couldn't fit everything into one week. So today we're going to look at um, key dates and specific events of historic interest. So the Great Pestilence, the Peasants' Revolt. We're also going to talk a little bit about immigration because that ties into something that happened during the Peasants' Revolt. And the next week, we will look at architecture, daily life, and the establishment of medieval guilds. So again, if you haven't already done so, please mute your microphones. All right, so if you recall, last week I said that the Romans pulled out of Britain around 410 AD, and after they left, London went into a very kind of long, slow decline uh, the country was coming under attack from several different tribes. So you had people, the Picts up in Scotland, you had various tribes from Northern Germany, um, from Denmark, uh, the, the Angles were from Denmark. You also had Saxons who originated in Northeast Germany. 
and of course the Vikings. Okay, somebody has their, can somebody please mute their microphone? If you haven't already done so, I'm getting feedback from somebody here. Um, so anyway, lots of different tribes coming in, lots of attacks coming from all over the place. Now, interestingly enough, I mentioned the, the um, Angles and the Saxons. Interestingly enough, the Romans, before they left Britain, they brought on part of this invasion themselves. Uh, so toward the end of their occupation, when the empire was increasingly under attack from these various pesky tribes, Rome hired Saxon soldiers as mercenaries to come fight on their side. So to fight against the native Britons, to fight from the Picts coming down from Scotland. And additionally, after the Romans left, there was a, a very powerful local tribal leader who was said to have invited the Angles, Saxons, and, and others in to help put down invasions from the Picts up in Scotland. So there were already some boots on the ground, if you will. So by the time of the Anglo-Saxon invasion, there were soldiers on the ground. Saxons had isolated farmsteads that they built in the surrounding countryside. And some of these, um, such as uh, Enfield and Chelsea, these actually, these were Anglo-Saxon um, villages, if you will, and they grew to form the heart of villages which still act uh, in modern London today. They're still there in modern London today, obviously. The Saxons took advantage of infighting amongst the native tribes and between the native tribes and the Romans. So they came over supposedly to work for the Romans, but they said, you know, let's take advantage of this situation. So they started establishing their own kingdoms within Britain. And by around 450, about the middle of the fifth century, they dominated parts of Britain and eventually they took over London. And the Angles on the other side, for their part, they settled into what we now know as East Anglia. So Suffolk, Norfolk, Essex, uh, that area there in the kind of just north, east on the, on the um, North Sea. But when the Saxons came in, rather than inhabit that Roman city that we looked at last week, that walled city, that one square mile, they chose to make their base about a mile to the west of the city, uh, what is now around the Charing Cross Covent Garden area. And they did this because they were fishermen and farmers. So the location suited them better. So the settlement kind of ran from what today is Charing Cross Covent Garden right down to the Thames. So they had a place again to dock their boats. Um, and before long, a market and really sizable community kind of grew, grew up in this area. And it was known as Lundenvig or London Trading Town. That's, that's what they meant by that. So what happened to the, to the old Roman walled city? that the Romans had built up. Well, historian Peter Aykroyd tells us that a large part of it was turned into pasture. So basically it was an area for cattle. There were some buildings there used as stockades. There would have been some wooden houses and market stalls that would have been erected within the walls, but pretty much that Roman city as we knew it, that area was, was pretty much gone. It was pasture, it was a place for the Saxons to keep their cattle. Now you've got to remember by this point, the Romans had been gone from London for about 200 years. And, and so the Roman structures that we looked at last week, they had fallen into ruin, pretty much fallen into ruin. With the exception of the city wall, really very little of, of Roman London remained by the time we got to the Saxon period. But there was one interesting structure that was still in demand and that was the old Roman amphitheater. Remember, we saw that last week under the Guildhall, just little remnants of it under the Guildhall last week. This was used by the Saxons for what they called their folk moot. And for those of you not familiar with that term, a folk moot was usually an open air gathering of a community, sometimes headed by a royal official um, for the administration of local affairs, particularly for the administration of justice. And by the time we get to Alfred the Great, the folk moot seems to have been the mainstay of, of legal administration at this time. So they were still using that, that area, that building for that, um, the amphitheater, uh, and the, the walls still stood, but everything else was pretty much falling to ruins. And then around 700, beginning of the eighth century, Ludenvig was a, a very prosperous trading center by now, both by land and by sea. But the town came under threat in the ninth century, around from the 840s onward, from a wave of attacks from Danish Vikings. And as with Boudicca's attack on Londinium, we get a lot of our history regarding these Viking raids through a sort of a secondhand source. In this case, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of 865. 
Now, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle consisted of an annual record of events. It, they didn't really start writing it until around 890, even though it was the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of 865. So it was really taking off during the reign of Alfred the Great. So this is written after the fact of these attacks. A raid in 842 was described, and this is loosely translated, <laughs> by the Chronicle as there was a great slaughter in London. Ludenvig was attacked again in 851 when another raiding party, reputed to have about 350 ships, came to plunder the city. And then in 865, the Vikings, or the great heathen army, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle called them, they launched a really large-scale invasion of the Kingdom of East Anglia, again on the North Sea where the Angles were just north, east of London. Before long, the Vikings were turning their attention toward Lundenburg once again, toward London once again. The city was captured around 867, and it was subsequently recaptured um, by the next great important figure in history that we're going to discuss, Alfred the Great. But before I get to Alfred, I, I do want to clarify something. So you've heard me refer to the Saxons, you've heard me refer to the Angles, and you've heard me refer to the Anglo-Saxons and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. The term Anglo-Saxon, that this is not an amalgamation of the Anglos and the Saxons, the term Anglo-Saxon appears to have first been used in the 700s, in the eighth century, by writers in Europe as a way to distinguish between the Saxons in Britain and those that were in Europe, hence the Anglo-Saxons. So just to kind of clear up any confusion about that. So here's Alfred. Alfred was the king of Wessex, which is now the area of Hampshire, Dorset, Wiltshire, Somerset, if, if you know Britain's, uh, Britain today. Um, and as I said, remember the, the um, Anglo-Saxons had their own little kingdoms within Britain, so he was the king of Wessex. And to this day, he's one of only two kings in British history to hold the title of the Great. Now, this title was not bestowed on him in his lifetime. It was given to him by historians in the 16th century who admired his achievements. And the other king who held this title was King Canute, who we will briefly touch on a little bit later. So Alfred took back control of London in 886. He forced the Vikings to retreat to the north and the east. He was very good at settling treaties with Vikings. Um, and so basically what he did was he kind of divided Britain between the Anglo-Saxons and the Danes, and you can see uh, on this, and of course there were still some native tribes, as well. but you can see on this map here um, where the English territories are, where the Danish or Norse ter territories were, um, where some Celtic lands were. So it was kind of fractured between the Anglo-Saxons, the Danes, and then still some native tribes. Okay, so after driving the Danes out of London, um, Alfred really sat down to do some work here. He did some urban renewal in the city. Within 10 years, he had repaired the Roman walls. He had recut the defensive ditch uh, around the walls. He had created a new street plan. He redeveloped the waterfront. And he laid out the beginning of what we really now think of as the present day city of London. And the boundaries of, of, of Alfred city today are still defined by um, uh, London uh, Wall Road which is where some of the historic city walls are. So we started really seeing the beginning of the city of London really take shape again after the, um, after the Romans had left. But he also had other achievements. Uh, his, his achievements beyond reestablishing re London um, were very important as well. Alfred was said to have formally established the London Mint that later became the Royal Mint. Now the Romans had opened a mint in London in around 290 and but for about 200 years or so after they left, no coins appear to have been struck in Britain. They, no evidence of any coins after this for a couple of hundred years. And following the consolidation of these various Anglo-Saxon English kingdoms, a London mint was in operation again from around not, not too long after about 650 or so. And at first its existence was kind of precarious. It was off and on, coins were minted, then they weren't. But from the time Alfred the Great came around, uh, its history became continuous and increasingly important. And today, the Royal Mint is the world's leading export mint. It makes coins and metals for an average of 60 different countries every year. Um, but its first responsibility is to make and distribute United Kingdom coins and to supply official metals. 
no longer in London. It's been in Wales since the 1960s, but Alfred is really the one that kind of got the mint going again and solidified that. He also laid the foundation for English law and advanced learning throughout the land. Uh, now, he didn't create English law as we know it today, but he did codify and drew on some of the most respected laws from earlier kingdoms. And from Alfred comes what came to be eventually came to be English common law. And that really does form the legal foundation of the United Kingdom and the United States as well. And most importantly within these laws was the concept that everyone, even a slave, and yes, there were slaves in Anglo-Saxon um, London and Anglo-Saxon Britain, as well as by the time we get to the Normans, there were still slaves then. Everyone, even a slave had rights and everyone, even the king lives under the law and must obey it. Alfred also championed education for everyone in the landowning classes, including women, which was quite unusual. I don't know that there are many landowning women at this time, but that was very unusual because up to this point in time, really clergy were the ones who were mostly educated. So he really championed education. Uh, his scholars recorded Beowulf. Again, they compiled the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is still our leading historical source for this time period. All right, so and they translated major religious and philosophical works into English. So he really championed learning. And finally, he reintroduced Christianity. Now, the Vikings and Saxons had largely been what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, again, described as heathens. Uh, there were Christians around. There were Christians around as early as the late Roman period, and there were actually Christian kings before Alfred as well. But again, with the, with the Vikings coming and going and all this upheaval, um, Christianity really hadn't taken a firm hold again uh, in the in the area. So he founded a number of churches in London during his reign, um, including um, St. Peter at Vincula, which was later incorporated into the Tower of London. And I briefly talked about that last week. So this is why he was given this title of the great because of all of his achievements. But of course, what he will most be remembered for is the reestablishment of London as a city. And this is a photo of a plaque that's um, found on the bank side near Southwark Bridge. And it was put up by the Museum of London in 1986 to mark the 1100th anniversary of Alfred's resettlement of the Roman city of London. Okay, now through the 950s, the city became the most important commercial center in England. And you've got contemporary writers at that time talking of exotic international trade. There were markets at East and West Cheap, which is what is now Cheapside. Again, if you've been in the city of London, which is kind of basically means the high street or the main street, the market street. Many archeological remains from the city uh, have been found in the form of things like decorative metalwork, Weaver's loom weights. And, and this kind of gives us again, an example of the industry that was taking place around there at this time. And it was at this period that London really became a political focus as well. So we start seeing many Royal councils held in London and we start seeing laws that are issued from, from the city. And the city of London itself had its own government. It was divided into 20 wards. Uh, Earl them in charge of, of each ward. Um, they also had their own port reeve, which was. When it asks you if it's okay to be recorded, um, it's okay. Otherwise, could you please mute your microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so they each had their own port reeve, and this was kind of like the the um, precursor to the county sheriff. So a county sheriff, like we have today, and these people were responsible for collecting taxes. And during this time, a peace guild was also established to pers to pursue criminals. So we're beginning to see the growth of a civic establishment, not on. Not unfamiliar to us today. You know, we have a county sheriff, we have police forces, we have aldermen, um, we have city wards, that kind of thing. So we started seeing this grow up um, at this time period. Okay, so I'm going to leapfrog ahead now. Like I said, there's so much to cover here. So we're going to skip several hundred years, including the next set of Viking invasions. Um, they were coming and going all the time, along with the, with the Saxons. So we're going to jump ahead to this guy, uh, Ethelred the Unready. He was the King of England from 978 to 1013, and again from 1014 to 1016. Now he was given the name Unready um, because this meant poorly counseled. 
And this was due in part because he really could not keep the Vikings out. He couldn't work with them on treating the treaties the way Alfred the Great did. He just wasn't that successful at that. And in fact, during the, for his first reign, like I said, he had two different time periods here. During his first reign, he was driven out of England by King Sven Forkbeard of Denmark, who you see here on the right. And Sven came in and kind of took over. He was the king of Denmark from 986 to 1014. And he came to the throne by overthrowing his father, King Harold Bluetooth. Now, Harold was the first Scandinavian king to be baptized a Christian, but his son was said to be a pagan and he did not take to Christianity. Um, and he ended up overthrowing his father a few years later. Uh, now, Harold, Sven's, Sven's father, Harold, doesn't really figure into our story, but I do want to mention him in passing because, passing because he was famous for two things, really. He united Denmark and Norway in 958, but he also had a dead tooth, which was kind of a dark blue gray color. That's why he got the nickname Blue Tooth. His actual name was King Harold um, Gormson, but everyone called him uh, Harold Blue Tooth because of this dead tooth. Why am I mentioning this guy in our context? Well, because he has a connection to our world today. In 1996, three industry leaders, uh, Intel, Ericsson, Nokia, they met to plan the standardization of short range radio technology to kind of to support connectivity and collaboration between different products and industries. And during the meeting, a guy named Jim Kardick from Intel, he said, let's use Bluetooth as a temporary code name for our project because they were you know, worried about um, espionage from other companies and that, you know, spying from other companies. So he said, let's just call our product, our, our project Bluetooth. They won't know what we're talking about. And he was later quoted as saying, King Harold Bluetooth was famous for uniting Scandinavia, just as we intended to unite the PC and cellular industries with a short range wireless link. Bluetooth was only intended to be a placeholder, a temporary code name for this project until the marketing could come up with something better, but it remains till this day. So, Bluetooth technology is named after this, this king from way back when. Okay, but on to, on, on to back what we were talking about. So Sven Forkbeard, he made several raids against England, the first being in 1002, and that was to avenge the death of his sister and brother-in-law in what was dubbed the St. Bryce's Day Massacre. This took place on um, November 13th, 1002, and why did this happen? Well, Ethelred was responding to Viking raids. Um, the Vikings would come in and what they would do is they would basically make monetary demands um, in the form of what was called Danegeld. So it's kind of like protection money. So, you know, we come in, we're gonna, we're gonna take hostages, we're gonna demand money off you. If you give us money, we'll, we'll keep, you know, we'll stop invading you basically. So Ethelred was getting kind of tired of this. He was fearing for his own physical safety. So he decreed on St. Bryce's Day, um, November 13th, that all Danes living in English territory should be killed. Now I said English territory, remember um, Alfred, had, Alfred the Great had split up um, Britain between holdings for the Danes, holdings for, for the Anglo-Saxons. So if you were living in um, uh, the Dane law, which is where the Danes could legally live, those people for the most part weren't touched. But if any Danes were living in English territory, Alfred decreed, they should all be killed. It's, or not Alfred, sorry, um, Ethelred. It's uncertain just how many Danes did die. Um, and some some even say, well, calling it a massacre is a bit of a stretch. We we don't know for sure. Uh, as I said, the Dane, the Dane law, those areas in Britain held by the Danes, they would not have been involved, but there is evidence suggesting that border settlements right on the edge of the Dane law in towns such as Oxford, um, that these were the site of, of massacres, um, in fact. We know from a document issued by Ethelred in 1004 that Danish families under threat during the massacre took refuge in a local Oxford church. And when the locals attempt to remove the families from that church, they were not successful. And they ended up setting fire to the church and killing everybody within there. Um, and then, then in 2008, St. John's College in Oxford um, found a burial site that was discovered holding the body of over 35 Viking warriors. And you can see a picture from this. The skeletons showed evidence of, of violent death. Uh, many of the attacks appeared to have been from behind, uh, which kind of led historians and archeologists to believe that this was a massacre. Now, 
well, this was officially Sven's rationale for invading England. He said, I'm going to come back and take revenge on my sister and brother-in-law who were killed during this. Some historians argue that the main motivation for the raids was most likely to be the prospect of generating revenue. Again, coming in, getting that Dane Geld, you know, getting the protection money. But nonetheless, this massacre opened England up to a series of raids. Uh, so Sven made raids in 1003 to 1004, in 1006 to 1007, 1009 to 1012. And at the same time he was making raids on England, another Viking, a guy called Thorkill the Tall, he led an invasion into England as well. Now, initially, Londoners put up a strong resistance against Sven, and that's in part because Thorkell, who invaded England, actually did end up making an alliance with Ethelred. So the two of them kind of held their ground against Sven in London. But Sven went, he went west, he went over to Bath, um, and the Western Thanes, the Western, Western lords, they submitted to him. They gave him hostages. They were afraid of, you know, being killed and having their towns destroyed. And then the Londoners soon followed suit. They were really afraid of, of Sven and his revenge if they resisted any longer. So King Ethelred sent his family, including the future Edward the Confessor, his son, into exile in Normandy, uh, where, where we now think of as France. And he soon followed them. And on Christmas Day, 1013, Sven was declared King of England. Again, don't worry about all these names, all these dates. They're in the handouts. There's no quiz, obviously. Now, after all of this, so Sven, you know, finally raid, 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 finally declares himself king. He's declared king. He becomes king of England. He dies five weeks later. So the guy, guy didn't have much chance to enjoy um, his kingdom in England. So he dies, and he was succeeded by his son, Canute. But the English nobility at this point, they rallied around, and they said, let's bring Ethelred out of exile. So Canute goes running off back to Denmark, albeit temporarily. But um, now, now we've got Ethelred back. So Ethelred comes back, but then he dies in 1016, and he is succeeded by first his son, Edmund Ironside, Edmund, again, not at all successful at keeping out uh, keeping out the Danes. So you've got, again, um, Ethelred on the left here. You've got Edmund in the middle. Um, but Edmund himself was not very successful at keeping everyone out. Canute comes back. He actually marries Ethelred's widow, Emma. And he makes a deal with Edmund, Ethelred's son. And he said, listen, we'll split the kingdom. Let's, let's split it between us. But shortly after that, Edmund dies. And then Canute becomes sole king of England. And one more little aside, kind of funny aside here, going back to Sven Forkbeard. There is a barber shop in Camden Lock called Sven Forkbeard Barber Shop uh, in Camden Market. And you can go in and they've even got like phony armor and stuff, but they're really playing off the name of Sven Forkbeard. So he's still remembered in some, some places. So that brings us to Canute. Canute was an interesting guy. Um, he was the king of Denmark, Norway, and eventually England. So he had an empire stretching across the North Sea. He was also called the Great. Why? Because he was very astute, politically astute. He, he established a peace between the Danes and the English. He said, I'm going to rule through existing English laws. Um, if you remember when we talked about, uh, well, actually, we haven't gotten one yet, never mind. I mentioned him, but we haven't talked about, we'll get to him later. But he, so he was very astute about saying, okay, how do I work with this population? How do I say, I'm going to incorporate some of your laws, I'm going to incorporate your customs, uh, your values, so as not to alienate everybody. So he did that. Uh, he promoted Englishmen as his advisors, which was very important. Again, kind of reconciling with them. And he decided to reconcile with the church and he declared himself a Christian. So he was being very savvy about how to be accepted here in, in England. Now, while all this was going on, Edward the Confessor, um, the son of Ethelred the Unready, he remained in Normandy. Um, and when Canute's direct heirs died, Edward became his successor because remember um, Ethelred's um, widow, uh, Edward the Confessor's mother, actually married Canute. So he was he was Canute's stepson, he became his successor. Edward was the great, great, great grandson of Alfred the Great, as I said, son of Ethelred the Unready. He was a very pious man. He had very strongly held religious views. 
rumor has it that he was celibate despite being married. He was the only English English king to be canonized. And although he was said to be very pious, the, mi the minute he became king, he pretty much stripped his mother of all of her property and wealth, which you can question whether that was a very Christian thing to do. Maybe he was unhappy that she had married his father's enemy. We really don't know. Um, in March, I'll be doing a course, as I said last week, on queen consorts. And one of the very first woman we're going to talk about is Emma of Normandy, who was um, Edward the Confessor's mother. So we'll go into a little more detail about that whole relationship that she had with, with her son. Uh, what is he known for? What is Edward the Confessor known for? Well, he was best known for the refounding of the Great Abbey at Westminster. And we are going to talk about that in more detail next week. He was also somewhat as responsible for what essentially led to the Norman conquests. So what happened? Well, on the 5th of January, 1066, Edward the Confessor died. And the very next day, the Anglo-Saxon Witten, which was a council of high-ranking men, they elected Harold Godwin, the Earl of Essex. Uh, he was Edward's brother-in-law. They elected him to succeed Edward. Edward had no heirs. Remember, he was said to have been celibate despite being married. So he had no direct heirs. And Harold had no bloodline, no blood link really to the king. And he wasn't even of royal blood himself. He was basically just the husband of, of Edward's sister. But he was a leading Saxon lord. He had won a number of battles for Edward. Um, even though he didn't have royal blood, his, his family lines were quite strong. And he also claimed, though there were no witnesses who could verify this, that Edward's dying wish was that Harold, his brother-in-law, succeed him. So he's named king, but the crown had scarcely been put on his head um, when his problems, when King Harold's problems started. So up in Yorkshire, you've got Harold's brother. And Harold's brother um, joined forces with the king of Norway, who had landed with an army. They, de they decided to scheme together and they wanted to lead an insurrection against Harold. So Harold had to hightail it up north from London to repel the, the invaders. It was a short but very bloody battle. I think it lasted about a week, but, but quite bloody. So he marches his troops up there. Meanwhile, over in France, you've got this guy, William Duke of Normandy. He was a distant cousin of Edward the Confessor and he starts kicking up a fuss. Now, if you'll recall, Edward's family had fled to Normandy during the Viking invasion led by Sven Forkbeard, so, and Edward had stayed over there, so they had connections over there. Edward remained in Normandy, actually, until he became king. In 1051, Edward invited William, Duke of Normandy, to come over to my court, come on over to England, have a visit, and according to William, he promised to make him his successor. So now we've got two people saying, you know, Edward said I was his successor. William also claimed that Harold himself had promised William that he would be made king after the death of Edward. How did that come about? Well, in 1064, Harold was involved in a shipwreck and he was handed over to William. And William forced Harold, according to Harold, into swearing an oath that Harold would help William become king after Edward died. Now, Harold supposedly took this oath over a box and in this box was the bones of a saint. And in the Middle Ages, oaths were, first of all, taken very, very seriously, but particularly if you were taking them over the bones of a saint, which Harold did not know he was doing, apparently. So this supposedly meant, you know, he had sworn that William would be king. So meanwhile, you've got, so that's how the whole setup of why William thinks he should be, he should be king. So Harold's fighting in the north. And William takes advantage of this opportunity to raid from the south. Now, Harold, they, they, expected, they expected Harold was going to raid all summer. And in fact, at one point, Harold had his, I mean, they expected William was going to raid all summer, come over from France. Harold had his troops down ready for William's invasion earlier in the summer. It never happened. And then, of course, Harold gets distracted because he has to go up north and fight off this insurrection. So his troops are up north fighting. William says, perfect opportunity comes on over, invades from the south. So you've got Harold and his very sick, depleted, wounded army marching over 185 miles south, you know, no trains or cars then, obviously, to do battle with Duke William of Normandy. So his troops, Harold's troops are exhausted. William's troops, they're fresh, they're rested, they're just hanging around, you know, waiting, waiting for the fight. And on October 14th, 
at Battle, which was near Hastings, because actually um, it did not happen in Hastings, but at Battle nearby, um, this huge Battle of Hastings began. Now, at first, the Saxons seemed to have the upper hand, but slowly the Normans gained control. It was said King Harold was struck in the eye by a Norman arrow and killed. We now don't know if that's, now historians are even discounting that fact, that maybe he wasn't. In fact, that you can see this depicted on the Bayou Tapestry, and some people are saying, no, that's not even an arrow going in his eye. He's holding on to something. But supposedly, he was struck, and we know he was killed anyway. And the battle raged on until all of Harold's uh, bodyguard were slain. And on Christmas Day, 1066, William is crowned King of England. This effectively ended centuries of off-again, on-again Anglo-Saxon rule with the Vikings. It's pretty much put, put the end to all of that. Okay, so after he defeated the English army under Harold at the Battle of Hastings, um, Harold, or William started marching, very slow, marching north, um, subjugating towns as he went along the way that fall. Uh, finally, he formed an encampment at Westminster. Remember, I said last week, Westminster wasn't part of London at this time. We we're still talking about that one square mile city of London area. So this was considered outside of London, although this is where um, the Great Abbey had been built by Edward the Confessor. There was a palace there at Westminster where kings had been living. So he kind of settled himself down there. He threatened to besiege and ransack the city. Uh, you still had many of the leading men of the Anglo-Saxon court um, in, within those city walls. They had congregated there for their protection. Uh, but they, they agreed to a peaceful surrender. And as a result of that, um, William gave the city a charter. And this is, you can see this, I'm sorry, this is really not a good picture at all. It's very, very, once I blew it up, it was very blurry. Um, but this is the charter, and it was kind of a reward for the city peacefully uh, surrendering to him. And it was good for both sides. So this is a very small but very iconic piece of vellum. It's called the William Charter. It's the oldest document in the City of London archive. And it was given by William to the city in 1067. It's only something like about six inches by about an inch and a half. Uh, very, very tiny. It has these two slits. You can see the larger one was a seal tongue. And the other was the tie for the seal. The seal has, has come become detached. The seal impression is uh, really imperfect at this point, but it is one of the earliest surviving examples from William's reign. The charter itself is written in Old English. Um, again, notable because not written in William's native Norman French. So we're seeing the same thing we saw with Canute, where William is now trying to get on the side of the English by saying, you know, I'm not going to try to upturn everything. So I'm going to speak your language. I wrote this, this um, charter, which is it, it's in the form of an administrative letter. And this was a, a style commonly used by early English kings. Um, but I'm writing it in, in um, not my Norman French, I'm writing it in Old English. And when we translate it into modern English, it basically says, William King greets William the Bishop and Geoffrey the Port Reeve and all the citizens of London, French and English, in friendly fashion. And I inform you that it is my will that your laws and customs be preserved as they were in King Edward's day, that every son shall be his father's heir after his father's death, and that I will not that any man do wrong to you. God yield you. So this really reflects William's recognition of the importance of London and the, you know, he has a great concentration of trade and wealth. He doesn't, he wants to protect that. He wants to safeguard that. And it was a key means whereby he won the support of Londoners because he's basically guaranteeing the city autonomy. And it reflected London's already established international character, right? Because he's saying, I'm addressing both the French and English who are living here. Uh, so both of you. And I'm treating you with equal status. I'm not giving preference to the French. It's especially significant because it's the earliest known royal or imperial document to guarantee the collective rights of the inhabitants of any town. So it's not directed to a sp specific groups like merchants or to institutions like major churches. It's the inhabitants of this whole city. It confirmed the citizens' rights and privileges that were already in existence. He said, we're gonna use the same laws that were the laws under Alfred. Uh, and one of the primary concerns that people had at this time 
he also concerned could addressed because he said look i'm going to ensure that the succession to property is not subject to arbitrary royal intervention uh, remember when we were talking about the romans last time and i talked about boudicca and the revolt and how the land her husband's property was taken from her um you know by the roman emperor well, William's saying, no, look, I'm not going to come in and grab land after someone dies. It goes to the son and heir. So this was a big, a very big deal um, for London um, and, and for all of this. And you can go to the um, City of London archives and see this uh, charter and see the, see the seal. Okay, now I want to talk about some key events that happened in the, in the Middle Ages. So in 1348, the Great Pestilence, which also became known as the Black Death, although this was not a label given to it until the 1800s, it spread through Asia, North Africa, and continental Europe. And it finally reached England in midsummer. And by November, it had spread to London. And it was especially virulent in, in these large cities such as London because of overcrowded conditions, because of poor sanitation, and look, medieval London was filthy. There's no way around it. There were no pavements. So people walked on bare ground. Often the ground was covered in excrement, both human and animal. There'd be rotting food on the ground. There'd be entrails of animals. Now, eventually many of the streets became absolutely impassable. So people were hired to use rakes to clean up the filth. And although the job itself was pretty abhorrent, no one really wanted to do it, but these individuals were paid much more than the average working man. They, they got a good salary for doing this. And they were referred to as mug, muckrakers because this was a term, and this was a term, muckrakers, you've probably heard this term. This was a term made, made its way into modern language much later via a speech by President Theodore Roosevelt. And he used it in reference to journalists who dug up for money, salacious scandals and gossips about politicians. So that's where we got the term muckrakers from, from these guys that would take the rakes and get rid of the muck in the streets of London. Now, there were steps to try to control these unhygienic conditions. Uh, there were ordinances forbidding the emptying of chamber pots out windows, but they were largely ignored. In 1348, a law was passed stating that anyone dumping refuse in the street would be fined two shillings, which at the time was a considerable amount of money. But in addition to these unsanitary conditions, the city's rivers, and this is where the citizens went for their water, these were heavily polluted. So you had butchers regularly dumping rotting meat and organs, organs into the Thames and, and other rivers. And so these rivers also sometimes doubled as sewers. So you had all kinds of pollution going on for the water. So a very dirty city, a very crowded city, you've got the pestilence coming in. And another reason this plague seemed to be especially deadly was by the time it reached London, it appears to have been a combination of two types of plague. Bubonic, um, which came um, from fleas um, and affected the lymph nodes, and pneumonic plague, which affected the lungs of bacterial. So it was kind of giving people the double whammy. It was merciless. People died within hours or days of falling ill. It did not discriminate based on class. Um, two ex-chancellors and three archbishops of Canterbury all died in quick succession. Parliament went into recess due to this, this pandemic. Historians believe that a, a large black slab that's in the southern cloister of Westminster Abbey, they think this may cover the remains of the abbot of Westminster and 27 of his monks who were also killed in the plague. So these, these people weren't even within those crowded city walls, but the plague was spreading very quickly. People were dying in droves, sometimes up to 200 a day. The city struggled to bury its dead. You had new cemeteries built outside the city walls. Remember the Romans themselves always buried their dead outside the city walls, but now you had new cemeteries being built. You had bodies being deposited in what became known as plague pits, sometimes 60 or more bodies put into one pit. And by the time the plague had exhausted itself in the spring of 1350, up to 30,000 of the city's 70,000 inhabitants had died. So the population took a huge, huge hit. And then in 1361-62, the plague returned to England again, this time causing the death of around 20% of the population. Interestingly, this time it was mostly children and adolescents uh, and mo more males than females. We, we don't know why. 
But this was about one of 40 plagues to hit London between 1348 and 1665. So there were major outbreaks every two or three decades that would wipe out about 20% of the population. So this was, this was a, a big hit on London. Now, I used the term rivers a minute ago, the plural term, because although we often associate the Thames with London's river, there were in fact other rivers that ran through that square mile. So what you see here are three existing, where you can still see a little bit of remnants or evidence of three existing rivers in London. Uh, on the left, there's a bit of the um, river fleet that's still left on Hampstead Heath. In the middle, um, this is now a sewer, uh, the Ephra, that was part of the Ephra River. And on the right, if you go to the Sloan Square tube station in Chelsea, the Westbourne runs above, right above the uh, train lines there, the, the tube line there. And this map comes from a website called The Londonist, and you can see there were many rivers running through London at this time. Uh, the main ones in the Middle Ages were the Tyburn, the Fleet, and the Walbrook. Uh, and remember, we talked about, uh, we were in the Walbrook area last week when we looked at the Mithras Temple. So you got the Fleet there and, and the Walbrook here. There's the Ephra, again, that I mentioned earlier, but several different um, rivers running through here. And this is kind of, this is very interesting. Again, this is over by uh, Walbrook. In Roman times, this area uh, included the site of the Temple of Mithras, which we looked at. It was considered a very holy place. Sacrifices were made to the gods in this area. Now, over the time, that river became even more important um, because the river was reclaimed. There were wharfs built, warehouses, small factories were built uh, in the Middle Ages. Now, the river was not nearly as grand as the Thames, but it was an important player uh, for trade, uh, river trade between Britain and the continent. And as I said, you, we saw some of these that still exist today. Now, this slide shows a piece of public art outside the Bloomberg building where we saw the Temple of Mithras last week. This is called Forgotten Streams. Forgot, sorry, Forgotten Streams. In 2017, an artist named Christina um, Iglesias, she installed this work, and it's in three sections. And it's meant to serve as a representation of the Walbrook. And it's laid uh, out in very close proximity to the original site of the river. It's very interesting. Um, I, I find it kind of fascinating, although it's not to everyone's taste. Uh, one art critic described it as a swamp, um, but it, it is very kind of interesting and pays, uh, pays tribute to that river. All right. Another key event that I wanted to talk about is the um, Peasants' Revolt. This had a huge impact on London. This uh, took place in 1381. It was also called what? Tyler's Rebellion. Now its immediate cause was the imposition of a very unpopular poll tax, a, a flat tax that's levied on every individual regardless of their income or wealth. But to understand the revolt, we really need to go back to a time shortly before the Great Pestilence, before the Black Death. So in the Middle Ages, the majority of the population lived in the countryside. So you had about 85% of the population that you could describe as peasants at this time. And peasants worked the land to yield food, fuel, wool, other resources. And you'd see the countryside divided up into estates. So the estates would be run by a lord or by an institution such as a monastery. And there was a social hierarchy dividing the peasantry. I don't have time to go into this in detail now, but at the bottom of the structure, you had serfs, and they were legally tied to the land they worked. They were pretty much slaves. They were obliged both to grow their own food and to work for the landowner. They were, in effect, really owned by the landowner. And then at the upper end, you had the freemen. These people were often enterprising smallholders. They rented land from the lords. Sometimes they even owned land in their own right. So they could sometimes make a considerable amount of money. Um, and then you had other workers in the countryside, you know, carrying out trades such as basket weaving, beekeeping. Basically, what you had was this very complex web of ties, kind of formalized by a sworn oath that defined the relationships between you got the kings at the top, obviously, the lords, serfs, so on, all the way down. In 1351, so before this, way, way before this revolt, the country was facing a serious labor shortage, and this was due to that unparalleled drop in population that I just talked about because of the Black Death. And because of this labor shortage, um, and I quote from a contemporary source here, there was such a shortage of servants, craftsmen, and workmen 
and of agricultural workers and laborers, the churchmen, knights, and other worthies have been forced to thresh their corn, plow the land, and perform every other unskilled task if they are to make their own bread. So God forbid these people had to go out and do their own labor. And as a result of this, workers were able to demand much higher wages because there were fewer of them doing more work. So suddenly they were in demand. So they, you start to see the little bit of this power shift where they'll, they can now negotiate for more money. Well, what happened to this? Well, it led to inflation, right? So, and the nobility also really didn't take kindly to this sudden shift in this economic situation or the fact that the, these workers could now demand more and the nobility are, wait a minute, you guys are working for us, but at the same time, the nobility needed them. So now you see inflation coming in. And as a result of this, the king at that time, Edward III, he put in place something called the statute of laborers. And what this was, was it essentially froze wages to take care of the inflation. But the bad part about this was it froze them at a pay level that was in place before the Black Death. So back when England was in a depression due to its involvement in the Hundred Years' War. So suddenly you've got workers who, you know, their, their wages are frozen, um, not only frozen, but they're actually making less money than they were to begin with. So if we jump ahead to 1381, the year of the Peasants' Revolt, Edward III's dead. His grandson, Richard II, is on the throne. So you've got workers who are already being paid very poorly. And now you've got this new crippling poll tax, and it's hitting everybody over the age of 15. Uh, it had been imposed upon them by Richard's government. It was the third time in four years that such a tax had been applied. And if each person being taxed, if they couldn't pay in cash, they had to pay in kind. So this meant they had to pay with their tools, with their seeds. These were all, these were things that they needed for their survival. If you're an agricultural laborer, you need these things. You can't give these things up to pay the tax. You need to be able to feed yourself and your family. And this kind of was the last straw for everybody. They said, okay, enough, we're, we're done with this nonsense. So the rebellion began in the Southeast of England in Kent and in Essex. And it was led by, among others, a guy named Watt Tyler. He was a Tyler of houses, hence his name, and John Ball, who was a priest. Now, the rebellion was called the Peasants' Revolt, but in reality, it was not just the peasants who revolted. There were artisans, there were urban working class people, there were even members of the clergy, ex-soldiers, all demanding justice. They were all saying, look, th this is enough. You know, They were demanding justice and equality. And they were after blood, they were after blood. So they attacked towns along their route to London, specifically targeting the homes of the nobility. Uh, they attacked fortifications like Rochester Castle, they released all prisoners held inside of prisons. And at Canterbury, they demanded that the archbishop, who they saw as an instigator of their oppression, they said, this, this person has to be replaced. And as they marched toward London, they garnered huge support, in part due to fear. People, you know, they threatened to destroy people's homes unless they joined this rebellion. But also there was this collective anger against the government at this time. And it was said they were about 110,000 strong when they reached London around the 11th of June, 1381. They proceeded to attack the suburbs of the city, including Lambeth um, on the south side of the river. They destroyed huge quantities of government records. And then they began to cross over from Southwark uh, on London Bridge, that only bridge again, across the river on the afternoon of the 13th of June. Now, London Bridge was a defensive bridge, but for whatever reason, the defenses were open from the inside, either in sympathy um, to the rebel cause or out of fear. For whatever reason, they opened up the defenses, the rebels advanced into the city. At the same time, you had another rebel base coming from Essex that made its way toward the west side of the city. They were joined by many local town folks. They attacked several jails. They destroyed the luxurious Savoy Palace that was the palace that was the home of John of Gaunt. He was the Duke of Lancaster and he was the King uh, Richard II's, the King's uncle. They set fire to law, uh, law books and buildings in the temple, which was the legal district in London. They attacked Clerkenwell Priory, which was headed by Richard's Lord High Treasurer. Uh, and so they killed roughly, they, they attacked there, but they also roughly killed around 150 foreign weavers and merchants, all of whom were Flemish. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. 
why did why did they attack the the Flemish? Well, this was a reflection on the attitudes towards immigrants in medieval England. So between 1330 and 13, I'm sorry, between 1330 and 1550, it is estimated that approximately 65,000 immigrants came to England. Many were seen as taking jobs away from the locals. Uh, many were seen as being given special privileges. In reality, this wave of immigrants was driven in large part because, again, because of this labor shortage after the Black Death, they needed more workers. But resentment was strong uh, amongst native Britons, particularly when after the Black Death in 1370, Flemish weavers were welcomed by the government and given the same rights and protection as English citizens. This did not go down well. Um, so King Richard II, he, he was only 14 years old at this time. He attempted to meet with the rebels. So this map I'm showing you are all the different places, places that were attacked. So Clerkenwell, um, Priory, um, we're going to talk about the Tower of London in a minute, uh, Marshall Sea Prison, where they released prisoners, so all the different places that things were kind of bubbling up and going on here. Anyway, Richard said, okay, I will, I will meet with the rebels. He attempted to meet with them on the 13th of June, but he soon fled to the Tower of London for protection uh, because that meeting did not go very well. And with him were members of his government and his royal household because he saw the vast numbers of all these rebels and said, no, we can't deal with this right now. This action, the fact that he kind of took off, uh, it further enraged the rebels. And so they started plundering and really burning the city. Um, and eventually the Tower of London, um, this fortress came under the rebels' sights. Now the rebels were angry that, that Richard had fled, but they didn't really blame him for their suffering. In fact, they even claimed loyalty to the king what they wanted was the death of what they called the traitors who governed on his behalf. So the following day on the 14th of June, Richard once again went off to meet with the rebels. This time he went over to Mile End to meet with them over here, not, not, too, not too far from the Tower of London. Um, so he went over there, but when he rode out to meet, the, and, and he said at this time when he met with them, he said, okay, I'll meet many of your demands. Um, but as he was leaving the tower, um, according to a contemporary account, the king had ridden out to meet the rebels at Mile End. The tower's drawbridges and gates had not been raised behind him, had not been put up behind him, and a mob of at least 400 men stormed the castle. The men-at-arms guarding the tower put up no resistance, and the peasants shook their hands as brothers and stroked their beards in a friendly fashion. So again, not sure why uh, they were allowed in, but they were allowed in. And once in the tower, they proceeded to behead, among others, Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was the, the Lord Chancellor, so he was in, in charge of a lot of the government, a lot of the um, financial things. And Sir Robert Hales, the Lord High Treasurer. Um, both, so both of these men had been blamed for this poll tax. And you can see here the rebels attacking people in the attacking those two men in the tower. Now, this marks the only time in history that the Tower of London was breached. And as an aside, one survivor of the tower attack was the young Henry of Bolingbroke. Uh, this was John of Gaunt's son. Remember, John of Gaunt was the uncle. So he was the so Henry was the cousin of Richard II, his father, John of Gaunt. It was the Savoy Palace that they burnt. He was said to have hidden in a closet as the rebels stormed the tower. Now, had he been caught, it is unlikely he would have lived to have become Henry IV. Um, yeah, Henry IV, 18 years later. So interesting, a little aside. So the following day after this attack on the tower, Richard II, once again, he left the city walls. He went to meet Watt Tyler and the rebels at Smithfield, just outside the city proper um, to meet with them. Now, he had agreed on that previous day to meet many of the rebel demands, but violence broke out at this meeting and the Lord Mayor of London, who was in Richard's party, he ends up killing Watt Tyler. Richard then rode up to the rebels and he stood right before them, which was either very brave or foolhardy. Um, but in this case, it worked to his advantage. He went up to them. He said, listen, go home, uh, go home peacefully. I promise you, I'll grant you your wishes. No harm will come to you. Again, they blamed his, his, his government more than they blamed Richard. This diffused the tension long enough for the Lord Mayor, a guy named William Walworth, to gather a militia from the city and the, the militia came in and said, okay, let's start dispersing these rebel forces. 
Richard, despite his um, telling the rebels, you know, I, I'll meet your demands, don't worry, he immediately began to reestablish order in London. And once the rebels were dispersed, he wanted to make an example of them. So he resented, uh, he stepped back on his previous grants to the rebels. The remaining leaders were hunted down and executed. And Richard himself went to Essex, where the rising had began, and he ordered what they called a pacification, uh, basically, um, of, of that area. So he really did kind of step back on this, and he wanted to, to set an example of this. Um, let me see here. I seem to have... Ah, there we go. Um, give me one second. I seem to have lost my page here. What did I just do? All right, give me one second. I wanted to talk about, yes, here we go. Okay, so this is the timeline as everything happened. Um, November, December 1380, you had that third poll tax in four years. Uh, May 30th, you've got these riots beginning June by June 5th. Watt Tyler is appointed the leader. And then from the 7th to the 12th, uh, the rebels march toward London, going through Rochester and Canterbury. They make their way into the city of London. Richard meets with them on a couple of different occasions. You've got the, the um, beheadings of Simon Sudbury and Robert Hales. Uh, then he meets the rebels again at Smithfield. Watt Tyler is killed. And by the 23rd of June, Richard has withdrawn all of his promises and support to these people. And then suppression begins. John Ball, the, the, other, the other person in charge, he was captured um, and, and he was hanged, drawn, and quartered. A very, very nasty way to die. Okay, um, there is one more footnote from this rebellion. Today, there is a Watt Tyler Country Park in Essex. It's 125 acres of country walks, wildlife, there's play areas, educational opportunities for children. There's a gift shop, a cafe. Uh, and this really just goes to show that as with Boudicca that we discussed last week, the English have a soft spot for their rebels. Uh, the park really has nothing to do with Watt Tyler per se. But this slide does show an art installation by a guy named Robert Koenig that commemorates the event and is part of a, a sculpture um, walk, a sculpture trail in the park. All right, I want to end with talking about immigrants a little more since we discussed the, the problem with the Flemish during the Peasants' Revolt. Like the United States, England is a nation of immigrants. We saw last week how the Roman invasion brought people to England from all over the empire. This week, we've been talking about the Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings, the Normans. And in the coming weeks, we'll be discussing the arrival of the Huguenots. These were French Protestant refugees. And then when we move into the 19th and 20th centuries, we're going to see a very wide mix of ethnicities and cultures arriving uh, on England's shores or Great Britain's shores. And of course, migration within the British Isles was also takes place, right? So you've got Welsh, Irish, Scots all moving around. In the Middle Ages, there was a constant migration to England from all parts of Europe, in addition to the Middle East and North Africa. As I said before, in the middle of the 14th century, immigrants from Flanders had a particularly high profile in England. They came over in quite significant numbers. Uh, they were Some of them were agricultural laborers, some were skilled cloth weavers, some were merchants who were involved in international trade. By the 1370s, however, they were increasingly seen as abusing the special privileges granted to them by the government, and they were viewed as enjoying unfair economic advantages over their English-born neighbors and their co-workers. So this, this became a real problem. Now, in the 14th century, the Crown began to develop a formal process known as denization. And this is a this is by which immigrants of good standing in his or her community could renounce allegiance to their former ruler and be given all the rights of an English born citizen. As long as they you know, said, nope, I, I no longer swear allegiance to my country that I came from. In 1440, the English parliament imposed a new tax on resident foreigners. Immigrants had to pay taxes before this time. This wasn't the first time. The difference was simply that aliens were now to be a special fiscal category. 
And the motivation for this was about finding new funds for the final stages of the Hundred Years War. But in reality, the initiative was just as much about regulation. So basically what this allowed was a census taking of resident foreigners. And this was a first step to kind of gaining greater control at a time when there was a lot of political misgivings, both about aliens' economic powers and about national security. So taxpayers of 1440 were identified most readily in terms of the languages they spoke and the accents in which they attempted to communicate in English. And additionally, you would have local juries of English-born men who were asked to provide lists of all known aliens living in their communities. And in some places, such as London, this was done with a great deal of thoroughness. Now, I do want to talk about Jews in medieval London. There were Jews living in London for two centuries during the Middle Ages. They first arrived from Normandy under William the Conqueror, and they proved to be a very valuable source of finance for the monarchs, for nobles, for sheriffs, even for merchants. They were, they were really an essential part of the economy. Their money helped build castles, cathedrals, monasteries, and abbeys. They helped pay for armies and wars and crusades. When they first arrived in England, they set up their base in London. In the 11th century, they were some of the wealthiest citizens of London. And compared to the general population at the time, they were worldly, scholarly, cultivated, sophisticated, very well educated. We know that the community from France that came over with William, they must have existed there for a long period of time because when they arrived in London, they spoke a form of medieval French and had French names. So they were well settled in France by this time period. Uh, this map here, um, you can see the, the medieval Jewish quarter here. In the 12th century, London's Jewish quarter spread over nine parishes within the city of London. Its main part was immediately south of the Guildhall, down to Gresham Street today and, and Cheapside. On the west side, it was bordered by Milk Street and what was called Jew Street in the east. Today, this is the modern day old Jewry. Uh, and we have records going as far back as 1128. And I think I have, a, yeah, I have another map here that kind of shows you um, some of the boundaries here. Um, the Christian parish church of St. Lawrence Jewry stood within the Jewish border. That's where it got its name from. The Jews built synagogues in the surrounding streets and archaeologists discovered a Jewish ritual bath from the mid 13th century under a modern building in Milk Street. So you can see right here in orange, this is where the Jewish quarter was within the city of London. Now, well, some of these people went into professions such as doctors, goldsmiths, pawnbrokers, rabbis, merchants. Many were often uh, moneylenders. Why is this? Well, during the medieval period in the Christian church, or during the medieval period at this time in the Christian church, usury was forbidden. And what usury was is when you lent money to make interest off it. That was forbidden. But of course, this rule did not apply to the Jewish community because they weren't Christian. So for this reason, in England, Jews received protection and assistance from the monarchs because the monarchs wanted to get money off them. And that protection was immensely important. They were considered wards of the monarchs. So this protected them while they were useful to the monarchs. Harming a Jew was seen as damaging the king's property, and it resulted in very severe penalties and punishment. William II, William the Conqueror's son, he used them for financing his army. And under Henry II, the community thrived and it grew. You had new arrivals coming from abroad. But after about 100 years of protection from English monarchs, things started to shift. Uh, Henry II protected them, but he decided it was more advantageous to start taxing them rather than borrow money from them. In 1187, he heavily taxed and confiscated a quarter of their wealth. Loans to monarchs were, again, necessary, um, but not profitable for the lenders necessarily. Um, so taxation worked better um, for, for the people borrowing the money. The real money really for, for the money lenders came from lending to landowners and merchants because they were kind of under the thumbs of the monarchs. They had not, not much choice. With many of the country's upper classes in debt to the Jewish community, to these Jewish money lenders, Jews were always a source of resentment. And in part, this stemmed from a, a general feeling and misunderstanding of these interest payments in a Christian society. They're like, wait, you know, usury is not the done thing. Why are you guys charging us interest? Even though they went to them to borrow money, 
Uh, and along with this, the crusades that were going on at that time, this instilled in people an animosity toward what they considered non-believers, non-Christians. So as popular opinion turned against England's Jewish community, there were increasing incidences of persecution, either officially sanctioned or by mob rule. And there's a bunch of them we have listed here. In 1189, Jews were uh, forbidden from attending the coronation of Richard I at Westminster Abbey. This was really a tragic incident. Some arrived bearing gifts for the new king and they were turned away. But rumors were spread that Richard wanted them banished and killed when they were turned away. And this led to violence outside the abbey, which spread to the city of London. 30 Jews were killed, their houses were burnt. In the next century, English Jews were subjugated to regular uh, persecution uh, or subject to regular persecution. Uh, when Richard I was kidnapped in Austria in 1192, he was coming back from the Third Crusade. His brother John, uh, in part, and then his, his wife Eleanor, uh, or his mother Eleanor of Aquitaine helped out with this as well. In part, Jews were, um, were pressured and forced to pay part of the ransom payment. At the end of the 12th century, Jews were less than 0.25% of the population, but they provided 8% of the income of the royal treasury. Under Henry III, Jews were made to pay a heavy burden in taxes and gradually their former rights and protections were stripped away. In 1215, Pope Innocent III convened the Fourth Lateran Council and it was decreed at that time that Jews and Muslims had to wear identifying markers on their clothing at all time or identifying clothing themselves to distinguish them from Christians. So it sound, sound a little familiar uh, for what we saw centuries later in Germany and elsewhere. Uh, as a result of this decree in 1217, Henry III ordered male Jews to wear a badge on the front of their outer garments. In 1232, there was the confiscation of the large synagogue in London, uh, and that was given over to the Brethren of St. Anthony of Vienna, so given to a Christian um, church. In 1244, a man named David of Oxford, said to be the wealthiest Jew in England, he died, and after, um, after they died, the personal money of Jewish individuals went to the crown rather than to their heirs. So unlike what William the Conqueror had promised, you know, when the father dies, the son gets the money. In this case, it's going to the crown. So when David died, David of Oxford died, Henry imprisoned his widow in the Tower of London until most of David's wealth was handed over to the king. And he used this money to pay in part for the rebuilding of Westminster Abbey and a shrine to Edward the Confessor, and we'll see those next week. In 1255, when a boy was found dead in Lincoln, uh, Henry traveled there in person. He condemned one Jew to be executed and 90 to be imprisoned in the Tower of London. There was absolutely no basis for this, but the allegation grew out of an earlier incident in 1173, uh, when a monk accused local Jews of ritually murdering a boy in the town, something referred to as blood libel, this was the false allegation that Jews murdered young boys to use their blood to make Passover matzahs. These accusations were not specific to England, by the way. Um, you saw this going on in other parts of Europe uh, in the Middle Ages. But after that, there was always suspicion about Jews whenever a boy was found dead. Now, in this particular instance, when 90 were imprisoned in the Tower of London, 18 prisoners were hanged, their property was seized by the crown and others were pardoned only after the intervention of Dominican and Franciscan friars. In 1272, the Great Synagogue of London was closed down. In 1278, almost 700 Jews were arrested around the country, probably on contrived charges of coin clipping, which is making the currency less valuable. Um, and they were sent to the Tower of London where 293 of them were hanged and their property was confiscated. And then in 1290, King Edward I issued an edict that all Jews were to leave England by November 1st or face death. They were allowed to take their cash and any portable wealth with them, but any property or any bonds, in other words, any money owed to them, this was all confiscated by the crown. And thereafter, Jews were not allowed back into England for over 400 years. Again, England was not the only country to do this. They were the first country to expel Jews, but this was followed by France, Spain, Portugal, and, and others. And you can see here, here's the uh, sign where the great synagogue had stood, marking where the great synagogue had stood. It wasn't until 1656, under the Commonwealth government of Oliver Cromwell, that Jews were welcomed back to England. Many settled in the east end of London. They became an essential part of the fabric of London life, and we're gonna see that later in this course. 
But this is a powerful reminder of the complicated and sometimes very perilous existence existence that foreign born residents experience in England and therefore London. And of course, we still see a lot of this going on today in, in some form or another. And now again, and we're gonna see other examples in the course as we go along, um, including when we get to the Great Fire of London in 1660. Okay, so next week, we're gonna stay with medieval London. We're gonna look at architecture and daily life, and we will look at medieval guilds. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen. I am going to turn my camera back on. Um, okay, there's nothing in the chat. Does anyone have any questions or any comments? I've, I've overwhelmed you all. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> that, that, was, that was incredibly interesting, particularly putting things in order. Now, my my brother is on the line, if he's still there. And near where he lives is reputed to be the point place where King Canute uh, was in a, a throne or a chair and uh, his courtiers told him that he could command the tides and they oh. would come in. And uh, he, he said, no, and you will see. And he, the tide came in. It's reportedly the village of Bossom. Uh, on the yes. coast. Yeah, that was a that was a a very famous story around Canute. Yes, um, you didn't I, get to the burning of the cakes. No, I did not. I know there's so that's another <laughs> story. Like, <laughs> as, King as Alfred and his kids, cake. <laughs> as school kids, we know nothing else about, about Alfred except Alfred, the cakes. But he burned the cakes. He burned the cakes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. That's another. That's another uh, not fairy tale, but I mean that's another story around. Yes, yeah, the the Canute and and the tide and King Alfred and burning, burning the cakes exactly. Um, other um, comments or questions? Uh, also, it was interesting the uh, the extent of that peasants' revolt was quite amazing. It was. It really was. I mean, it. it um, it was really quite incredible because it uh, it got out of hand. Not, I mean, it got out of, uh, it, it very quickly could have really brought down the city. And Richard, who we will find out, well, we're not going to hear a lot about Richard next week because, again, I'm trying to just focus it on London. But Richard uh, II, who was only a 14-year-old boy at the time, actually, with his advisors, handled it very well. Unfortunately, later, Richard did not fare so well. He did not turn out to be a great king by any stretch of the imagination. But pretty impressive for a 14-year-old to, um, to, to try to wrestle that to the ground. And indeed, they were able to suppress it. You know, they were, they were able to suppress it. But it was, quite, it was quite the uprising, for sure. Yeah, and got a lot of, again, a lot of support from people who were just fed up, you know, just, just fed up with, with the taxation and, and the uh, economic situation at that time. Other comments or thoughts or questions? The um, Bayer Tapestry um, really goes through mm. the scenes that took place and the deceit that took place um, prior to the invasion. It's uh, quite the story, yeah. It is. And there are, actually, I can share, I'll ask Leslie to share this because there's a couple of really good books on the Bayou Tapestry, how it was made, um, but also the whole story that it, because it is, it's like a scroll of just this whole story all along the way. It's quite, quite fascinating. Have you seen it in person? Have you? Yes, I have, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's quite impressive. It is. It is quite impressive. So um, it's also interesting in the Bayou Tapestry that you think that is the sort of that picture of Harold with something in his hand is the origin of the story that he got an arrow hit his eye. I um, it was new to me. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's the origin of the 
story, I think there may have been chroniclers that also attested to this, but apparently it it is at one of the origins because now there is more, you know how it is with history. I mean, historians are constantly contradicting each other and constantly coming up with new, you know, uh, new theories. And one of the newer theories is that in the last 10, 15 years, maybe, is that a lot of a lot of historians did base this. I think there was at least one contemporary chronicler that may have mentioned him getting hit in the eye, but I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to I'd have to follow that one up. Um, but certainly it was one of the you know, foundation stories from, from the bio tapestry. And they interpreted it as he had this arrow in his eye because he was killed. We know he was killed, the battle. And he was, you know, hanging onto the arrow, trying to pull the arrow out of his eye. And now, now there are other historians saying, no, 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 the, the arrow was never in his eye. That's not how he was killed. There's another chronicler who said he was killed a different way. So, yeah. And indeed, when you look at it, it's very, I don't know how you would extrapolate. It's hard to tell because yeah. um, it does kind of look like he's just kind of holding possibly holding something in his hand. The way it's made, you can't see his eye. So it's it's not really very clear. But that is where the po I think that's where the popular story grew out of, not the one contemporary written chronicle. I'm pretty sure there was one chronicler who wrote about him getting hit in the eye. But um, the way it spread and grew throughout history, and the Victorians love this stuff. I mean, they always pick up on these things, you know, so the Victorians really pushed this. Yeah, he was hit in the eye with an arrow. Um, and a lot of that, I think, was based on looking at the Bayou Tapestry. The um, treatment of the Jews that we've begun looking at on this episode um, continues. And how accurate do you think the feelings expressed by Shakespeare in Shylock in the Merchant of Venice, because it's it gets very close to the bone, and it it sets out on the face of it so accuracy accurately the what the Jews must have felt and how they must have felt themselves regarded, even though this was then in the seventeenth century when the the play was written and performed. Mm -hmm. um... I'm not an expert on that particular aspect, but I do agree. I think it was fairly accurate. Um, again, this is something, uh, Cromwell invited them back, but obviously this was after the fact, this was after Shakespeare. Uh, well, no, actually it was, yeah, um, when they came back and it was after Shakespeare, I guess. but. I think it was an accurate portrayal, and I and I think there, even though they came back, that's a that's that's kind of a stigma that I think has been attached to them ever more. And Shakespeare was a dramatist. Um, he had an astute eye on what was going on around him, but he also, as we know, as historians know, not a the most reliable source of historical information for things that were actually happening. I think in this case he did. I think there was a, a great deal of discomfiture. And again, this was happening not just in, obviously, England, but elsewhere, as in The Merchant of Venice, you know. Um, but also Shakespeare did, um, he definitely played fast and loose with, with, with some historical things, uh, as we will see. Right now, I'm working on another lecture for this Queen Consorts series, and I'm talking about Margaret of Anjou, um, and Margaret of Anjou's um, reputation was largely stained by by Shakespeare's play Henry the Sixth, um, who painted her as a she wolf, one of the she wolves. Uh, and uh, same thing with Richard the Third. You know, I mean, there was there was. Um, so I always say he's a dramatist. <laughs> he was a dramatist. He wasn't a historian. And you want to sell your drama the same way people want to sell drama today. I was talking to somebody about this in terms of headlines in newspapers and on websites. And you could have something happen, uh, something happen where there was a very peaceful protest or a peaceful something going on, but they will find the little pocket of it that wasn't because that's what's going to sell the newspapers. Nobody wants to read the stuff that's not dramatic and not not um, controversial and not 
so Shakespeare knew what he was doing in that sense. But I do think I do think you're right. I mean, I think that's a very complicated and difficult play. I um, attend a lot, a lot, a lot of theater, and I love Shakespeare. Um, but that's always been for, and I used to be involved in theater um, on a, on a, I was never an actor, but I mean, I was involved. Um, and I know that when um, one theater, I was two theaters I was involved in, you know, it was very tricky whenever they wanted to stage this as how you presented this to the audience and how you put context around it. And um, it made a lot of people very uncomfortable um, for a lot of different reasons. So, yeah, but I, I think it's, that unfortunately, you know, a lot of that stuff still follows um, follows on today. A lot of those prejudices. So yeah, but it was really nasty uh, in the medieval period in England, uh, and again, it, through the rest of not not just in England, through a lot of a lot of Europe. Yeah. Any other final thoughts or? Questions or comments? Okay, so I will see everyone. Thank you for coming again. Thank you for taking your time to come. I appreciate it. Um, we all have a lot of demands on our time, so I'm glad. I'm glad you came. I hope you found it useful or enjoyable. Uh, and. Um, I will see everyone next week. Again, this is being recorded, so it should show up. I think Leslie told me she tried to get it up by tomorrow, um, but usually within a few days, um, the, the videos show up on YouTube. And um, they are open to actually anybody. So <laughs> and if you know anybody else who might be interested in this, they can also, you can point them in that direction, but the, the videos will be up there. And if you think of anything, uh, you can send questions or comments along to Leslie and I will, um, she can pass them along to me. Or if you have my email, some of you do, I am in the directory, the Love Living at Home directory. You can also contact me directly if you think of something after this and I'll be happy to try to answer your questions. And I'm gonna try to find a little something also that I will send to Leslie to share um, on King Alfred and his cakes and Canute and, his <laughs> and the tides. Um, just those little folklore tales about those two kings, uh, the great kings. I will, I'll find something to send along about those if people are curious about what Peter was referring to. We will I'll send those along. Okay, otherwise I will see everybody or most of you hopefully next week. So have a good week um, and don't get blown away by the wind out there. It looks like the wind is picking up again. Um, see everybody soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.